Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we're reading the book entitled Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards. This book is a biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Mertie, who both were born in 1878 and led an exciting life of service and mission in the early days of the young and rapidly growing Seventh-day Adventist Church. In our last reading, we covered Chapter 7, where Roy, well into his career as an assistant pastor, evangelist, teacher, and dean, began to seriously consider finding a helpmeet to be his lifelong partner. He took the matter very seriously and prayed deeply and often about it. There was a young lady in his circle of service whom he thought would be just right, but he first sought the counsel of the Dean of Girls, a compassionate and godly woman whom he felt he could trust in such a delicate matter. They met and spent many hours together one night in council where the kind lady led him to many passages on the subject in the Bible and by Ellen White in the Spirit of Prophecy. Though at the end she advised him that the young lady he was considering might not be the best for him, Roy left the meeting feeling that the Holy Spirit had been at work. It was quite a while later when at a Wednesday night prayer meeting he was conducting, there was a beautiful young lady who came, demure and chaste, with a great love for the Lord, who was visiting with one of the local families. Her name was Mertie Ball, and it turned out that she was the daughter of an evangelist whom Roy's grandfather had brought to the Lord. Immediately, Upon meeting her, they fell into a pleasant discussion of things they had in common, since Grandfather Cottrell had spoken often and fondly of her father, and the name Cottrell was often spoken of in their home. It was not long before they met again, by arrangement, at a camp meeting where Roy was in charge of the youth meetings and invited her to play the piano and work with him on the music for the program. During that camp meeting in Oswego, New York, they made arrangements to steal away and spend a day at Niagara Falls, where they both recognized their great delight in each other's company. They were married a few months later, after Roy proposed to her by letter in a most poetic and scriptural way. The wedding took place in the home of the conference president who officiated and thus began over 60 years of love and marriage and service and mission. We continue our story today in chapter 8 entitled The Youthful Professor. Help! Please hold the ladder still. Instantly heeding Roy's call of distress, Mertie rushed to steady the precariously swaying pedestal atop which her hero was battling violently for his equilibrium while endeavoring to disengage himself from yards of sticky, stubborn wallpaper. Thank you, darling. You saved my life, gasped Roy, his merry grin emerging into daylight again. I'm not really so keen on becoming a mummy. Ugh, that paste tastes terrible. Despite the inauspicious start, Roy's plucky persistence won out, and within a few hours, there was noticeably less paper stuck to him than was plastered on the wall. He climbed down from the ladder and stepped back dramatically to get the full effect of his latest domestic accomplishment. Well, Mertie, what do you think of the place by now? It's going to be very attractive, dear, 
his little wife sighed happily as she busied herself with hemming up the last pier of curtains. I'm so glad we didn't pass it up just because it needed a few repairs. Oh, I guess a little hard work never hurt anyone, Roy remarked. Now, tomorrow, we'll paint the bedroom and kitchen. Then I'll see what it is giving the plumbing such a bad case of indigestion. Before long, we'll have ourselves a cozy little palace, you'll see. The newlyweds had just returned from a short honeymoon trip among their friends and relatives in western New York. The church people in Roy's old home at Ridgeway and also at Vienna had given them enthusiastic receptions, complete with numerous articles of furniture, dishes, and pots and pans for housekeeping. Now, having decided on the proper place for their nest building, they had set to work with paint, paper, and paste to make the desired transformation. At long last, the joyous day had arrived when they could move into their redecorated home with its frilly curtained windows and its daintily covered crates and boxes which served as cabinets and dresser. They were entirely happy. The weeks and months flew by, filled to capacity. Every Sabbath now found Roy conducting church services, and as the evenings lengthened, he held evangelistic meetings on Sunday nights. In late January, Murty and Roy attended the conference constituency meeting in Rome, New York. This was a memorable occasion for them because Roy was then ordained to the gospel ministry. A day or so later, Professor Frederick Griggs, principal of South Lancaster Academy, tapped Roy on the shoulder saying, May I have a few words with you, Elder Cottrell? Roy nodded his assent, and they withdrew to a small room where they could speak in private. As they were seating themselves, the professor pretended to speak quite sternly. Elder Cottrell, I'm determined to smash your opposition to South Lancaster Academy. As an alumnus of Mount Vernon Academy, Roy had, in his association with the young people of New York State, loyally sung praises of MVA and had encouraged many to attend his beloved school. Noting with satisfaction the raised eyebrows confronting him, Professor Griggs continued. Perhaps I'd better explain. You see, in planning for the coming school year at South Lancaster, we're making a few changes in the faculty. It looks as though we will be needing a new dean of men, as well as an associate Bible teacher. How would you like to join our staff? Then he smiled at Roy. I think if you did, Mr. Cottrell, your opposition to South Lancaster might vanish. You'll soon be as enthusiastic as the rest of us. Inwardly, Roy was delighted, but maintaining his quiet reserve, he replied, I thank you for the invitation to join your family, Professor Griggs. Mrs. Cottrell and I will be glad to consider it. He knew exactly what Murty's reaction to the good news would be. Beautiful South Lancaster was her alma mater and very dear to her. As soon as she heard the news, she was overjoyed and she wasted no time in urging Roy to accept the invitation. During the summer months which followed, they worked full time with an evangelistic tent company in New York. At the completion of the meetings, they were thrilled to see that their efforts were rewarded by a number of fine people won to Christ. With happy hearts and keen anticipation, Murty and Roy packed their possessions and started the trip to their new life 
in South Lancaster. It was hard to leave their first pretty little home, but Roy knew Murty could soon make another place just as lovely. One of the first people to greet them on their arrival in the picturesque little New England town was Elder E. E. Mills, who was operating the student book bindery. Extending a warm welcome, he delighted them by saying, I have a surprise for you. My horse and carriage stand idle in the barn most of the time. Old Dobbin needs much more exercise than I have time to give him. There are numerous trips you will have to take, and plenty of scenery around here that you won't want to miss. He pointed down the road. For instance, only a few miles away is the home of Mary Sawyer. The Mary who had a little lamb, you know? Then there is the famous Wayside Inn, an historic Lexington and Concord that you will want to visit. I'm sure. So whenever my horse and carriage are not in use, I want to place them at your disposal. As you may well imagine, Roy and Murty were pleased to accept this offer. This was years before the automobile came into general use, and the generous favor on the part of Elder Miles afforded the young Cottrells much pleasure in the months and years to come. As a large building program was just being completed at the academy, Roy donned an old shirt and overalls and willingly pitched in to help with the finishing touches. One morning, as he was wielding the paintbrush with a flourish, two teachers walked past and he heard one of them ask incredulously, Is that the new dean of men? Roy vigorously slapped on some more paint, as though oblivious to the slighting remark. However, just then, Professor Griggs himself came along to say, Well, Mr. Cottrell, so you are helping out with the painting. I was thinking that if you were a tall, mature, and professional-looking man like Dr. Brown, you could be a success without very much effort. But with your boyish appearance, you really will have to deliver the goods. Someone called the principal, and he strode off across the lawn without waiting for a reply. Humph, <laughs> thought Roy to himself, painting harder than ever. So I look inexperienced and green, do I? Just give me some time, and with the Lord's blessing, I'm sure to win their approval. When school opened that fall, Roy plunged into his work with vigor and determination to prove himself capable. Aside from his responsibility as Dean of Men, he was assigned to teach five major classes daily, one of these being History Three, or Ecclesiastical Empire. He found that teaching was a thoroughly enjoyable profession and recalls with pleasure that of the 14 members of that first history class, three became physicians, six entered the gospel ministry, one served many years as union conference president, and four others gave long service in mission fields across the sea. Despite his lack of experience, the boys respected and loved their house father. Indeed, his youthfulness helped him to better understand their adolescent problems and served as a strong bond to unite their hearts. June came, and most of the students had departed on vacation. Roy was in his classroom, giving it one last straightening up before the summer vacation, when the door opened and in stepped Professor Griggs. He glanced around the room, then said, Well, Mr. Cottrell, now that the school year is over, are you glad that you decided to cast in your lot with us at South Lancaster after all? Have we treated you right? Roy smiled as he neatly arranged the stack of papers, 
then replied thoughtfully, Yes, magnificently. All but once. Why? When was that? came the surprised inquiry. Well, you probably will not recall. But on the morning when we were moving into the new boys' dormitory, and a group of students were listening, you came and spoke to me quite brusquely. Yes, came the immediate reply, and I did very wrong. Can you, will you, forgive me? Looking back on that incident of more than half a century ago, Roy recalls, those were the words of a great soul who became one of the best beloved men in the entire denomination. In reality, that moment served as the beginning of a beautiful lifelong friendship. We love and cherish the memory of that generous, sympathetic, and dedicated man of keen understanding and friend of all, Frederick Griggs. During the second year at South Lancaster, the dean and his wife were faced with a sudden severe trial. One of their boys, a talented student, had become infatuated by the charms of his music teacher. On several occasions, the young couple had overstepped the social regulations of the school and were being retained only on the strict promise of correct conduct. One evening, while making the rounds after the last retiring bell, Dean Cottrell noticed a flicker of light in this young man's room. He tapped on the door. No response. Entering the room, he observed that the bed was apparently occupied. But inspecting more closely, he found that he had been fooled by a dummy. Something was definitely wrong. The next morning, the offenders freely confessed. They insisted that it had been important that they have a little conversation. Then when they discovered it was too late to return to their dormitories, they had spent the night with friends in the village. For years, Murty and the young music teacher had been close chums and Murty found herself as unhappily involved in their predicament as was her husband. Hour after hour during that trying day, the penitent peer appealed to the Cottrells to keep the secret. The teacher wept bitter tears. Not one of the four at dinner that day. They were too upset. The student pled with impassioned eloquence. Professor, you know something of my life. If it were not for South Lancaster Academy, I would not be a Christian. This school will have the credit for all I am now or can ever hope to be. If you send me out into the world alone, I don't know where I will go or what I will do. It seemed that the appeal would almost melt a heart of stone. But Roy's duty demanded loyalty to the school and its social standings. Near evening, it was agreed that Professor Griggs must be permitted to share in the secret. He too was entirely sympathetic. Yet, it was finally considered best for both young people to withdraw temporarily from the school. Eventually, however, they both achieved success in the master's work. When Roy first came to the academy as associate Bible teacher, a highly respected minister was the head of the Bible department and had filled that position for nearly a decade. One day, not long after the incident of the student and music teacher, he came to Roy and said, There are two members of our faculty whose influence gives me much concern. I am convinced that their general attitude is a menace to the spiritual interests of the school. Now when the academy board meets in a few days to select the faculty for the upcoming year, 
Will you be willing to join me in stating your conviction that these two members should not be reappointed? Roy consented, and at the board meeting, when the Bible instructor entered his protest, he concluded by saying, Now, brethren, you have heard the reasons for my position, and if these individuals are retained as members of the faculty, you may consider this as my resignation. Only a few hours later, the president of the board called Roy aside and told him they were inviting him to head the Bible department. When the department head learned that his resignation had actually been accepted, it was a terrific blow to him. His many friends sympathized with him, but it was too late now to retract what had been done. Referring to this unexpected turn of events, a member of the board remarked to Roy, Young man, let this be a lifelong lesson to you. Never hurl any ultimatums or threaten to resign in order to win a decision or to have your own way. The end of chapter 8. Chapter 9. Preparing for the Great Adventure The months and years spent at South Lancaster Academy, now Atlantic Union College, were busy ones. Vacation time always brought a welcome change of schedule. In the early summer of 1905, Roy and Murty were privileged to attend General Conference, which was held in a large tent pavilion on the campus of Washington Missionary College, then under construction. On the first Sabbath of the Great Meeting, Ellen G. White was to speak. Murty and Roy found front seats ahead of time, and ever after, they were to recall those solemn, thrilling moments when Mrs. White and others ascended the platform steps while the organ softly played, Be silent, be silent. What a marvelous time they had. Not only did they meet delegates from all over the world, but they were also able to visit such tourist attractions as the White House, the Capitol Building, the Congressional Library, the Smithsonian Institution, the Washington Monument, and the home of our first president at Mount Vernon on the banks of the broad Potomac. One day in early spring the following year, Murty was watching from the window with a good deal of impatience. Would Roy never come? He should be returning from class any minute now. If only he would hurry. She heard his familiar brisk step on the walk even before he strode into sight, and she was off to meet him with a letter clutched tightly in her hand. What's up? What's up? Roy wanted to know. Has something happened? No, dear, but guess what? The mail brought this letter, and it looked so important, and I was so curious that I didn't wait for you to come. I hope you'll forgive me, but I just opened it, and steady, steady, Roy interrupted, trying to sound severe. Just back up three sentences, if you please. How can I understand when you talk 90 miles an hour? Murty tried to catch her breath and swallow some of her excitement, then started in again. I opened your letter, dear. And it says you've, they've appointed you as a delegate to the General Conference Educational Convention to be held in June at College View, Nebraska. Oh, Roy, I wish I could go too. I must admit, I was rather expecting this, Roy murmured, scanning the contents of the letter for himself. When he had finished, his eyes were twinkling. And I'm just as eager for you to go as you are. I'm sure we'll find a way to finance it somehow. Not long after this, America was stunned to hear of the terrible earthquake 
that shook San Francisco on April 18, 1906. Then followed an appeal for our churches to circulate large numbers of the earthquake special signs of the times. Well, it's really tragic to think it had to come about in this way, remarked Roy, after hearing the announcement. But Murty, I believe this may be the means of providing your transportation expenses to College View. What do you say we order a thousand of these special signs and sell them in nearby towns in the evenings? Murty's wholehearted response was typical of her sunny outlook. And happily enough, though, the plan worked very well. On their way westward, they stopped over in Battle Creek, Michigan. At that time, the entire city was seething over the controversy between Dr. J. H. Kellogg, head of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, and the church leaders. Unfortunate in the extreme. Nevertheless, it was the burning topic of discussion in the newspapers and on the lips of the townspeople. Elder A. G. Daniels was on hand, doing what he could to remedy the situation, and he invited Roy and Murty to accompany him on the remainder of the trip to College View. Upon reaching Chicago the following evening, they boarded the Union Pacific. The ceaseless clickety clack of the train wheels soon had most of the tired travelers dozing, but not so with Elder Daniels. That venerable gentleman spent hours chatting with delegates en route to the convention. The following evening, when he arose to give the keynote address, he found his brain so weary and his thoughts so confused that he was unable to continue. Roy was much impressed by the lesson this taught him that in order to perform a task well, one must have adequate sleep. One afternoon at the convention, as Roy and Murty were seated on the spacious lawn, they noticed Elder Daniels and a young man conversing nearby. At length, terminating the conversation with a handshake, Elder Daniels was overheard to remark, I'll see you next year in Hong Kong. Afterward, they learned that that 20-year-old student was J.P. Anderson. That eventful day started him on half a century of mission service in China. Spying the Cottrells, Elder Daniel strolled over to where they were seated beneath a large shade tree and greeted them cheerily. Well, brother and sister Cottrell, this will no doubt come as a surprise to you. But we nearly stirred up your nest to send you as missionaries to Greece. But for the sake of South Lancaster, we're leaving you there for another year. After that, look out. Twelve months later, vacation time found camp meeting at Elizabeth, New Jersey in full swing. It was a gloriously beautiful Sabbath, and the morning service had just begun. Along with the others, Roy was lustily singing the opening song, when who should come striding down the aisle but Elder Daniels. Taking his place behind the pulpit, at the conclusion of the hymn, he announced, Now as we all stand with bowed heads, we will be led in prayer by Elder Roy F. Cottrell, Bible teacher at South Lancaster Academy. Taken by surprise, Roy unquestioningly complied, but he was certainly perplexed. Why should Elder Daniel pass by conference officials and veteran ministers to call upon a youth? He found out why later that same day when Elder Daniels came looking for him. Well, Brother Cottrell, I suppose you have heard from our secretary, Elder Spicer, by now. On the contrary, Roy had heard nothing. Then I have the privilege of telling you, he continued. You see, I've just arrived from an important council meeting in Gland, Switzerland, via Washington. And at that meeting, you and Mrs. Cottrell 
were appointed to mission service at Changsha, a mission in inland China. That was really news. Roy was astonished and thrilled, and he knew Murty would be also. As soon as he was alone, he hurried off to find a map so that he could pinpoint this strange place called Changsha, with which he would later find himself very familiar. Before leaving for home, Roy obtained permission through the courtesy of the chaplain of the famous Tombs Prison in New York City, to visit the millionaire murderer Harry K. Thor. For security reasons, they were not able to hold a private conversation. But through the bars of the little cell in the mighty Bastille, Roy endeavored to focus the attention of that unhappy man on the pardoning savior who is able to save to the uttermost. The now historic Youths Convention in Mount Vernon, Ohio, was next on the agenda. It was at this meeting that the Mission Volunteer Department of the General Conference was established. Professor M. E. Kern was chairman, and Roy was chosen as secretary of the committee, which selected the name Missionary Volunteer and laid the groundwork for organizing the vast army of Seventh-day Adventist youth. Dr. H. W. Miller was among those present at the convention. Eleven years had passed since Roy and Harry were members of the first graduating class from Mount Vernon Academy. Now, Dr. Miller was serving as examining physician for those selected for foreign mission service. As they had anticipated, Roy and Murty passed the test successfully. Now for the hustle and bustle of myriad preparations. Numerous vaccinations had to be endured. Papers must be signed. Passports must be procured. Books on China must be digested. Household articles must be sold. The freight must be packed in cases suitable for overseas shipment. All unfinished business must be cleared away, and the sailing date loomed ever closer and closer. It was Friday afternoon. They were polishing their shoes and making final preparations for their very last Sabbath in South Lancaster when there was a knock on the door. Murty hastened to answer and ushered in the guests three leaders of the denomination who had apparently come on urgent business. After the greetings had been exchanged, the spokesman hesitated for a moment, then began slowly. Brother and Sister Cottrell, we are in a real difficulty. School is to open next Tuesday, and it appears we shall have the largest enrollment in the history of the Academy. We have done our best to find a capable Bible teacher, but thus far we have failed. Roy braced himself for the words he knew were sure to follow. It seems most unfortunate to interrupt your plans, especially now that you're all packed and ready to leave. But could you, would you, consider staying with us until we can secure the right man for the position? After a serious discussion of the matter, the little group knelt to ask the Heavenly Father for wisdom. On condition that more strenuous efforts be put forth to find a qualified teacher, Roy consented to remain for two or three weeks. Professor Griggs boarded the evening train to Erie, Pennsylvania to personally interview Elder C. S. Longacre who was the pastor of the church in that city. He regarded the invitation favorably, but the president of his conference wrote the academy board saying, I am as certain that Elder Longacre should remain in Erie for the present as I am that my sins are forgiven. Days and weeks passed. The general conference was notified of the delay. Steamship reservations were canceled 
and the Cottrells were cordially invited to the congenial home of Elder and Mrs. E. W. Farnsworth. In Australia, the Farnsworths had lived and labored with Mrs. White. Also, Uncle Eugene's father, William Farnsworth of Washington, New Hampshire, had usually been regarded as the first Seventh-day Adventist. The Cottrells considered it a rare privilege to spend 14 wonderful weeks in the home of these distinguished and consecrated people. Never idle for a moment, Roy threw himself into his spiritual duties at the school. He conducted the first class in the history of foreign missions to be taught at South Lancaster Academy. Many took their stand on the side of the master and two large student baptisms followed. Robert Beckner was among several of Roy's students who dedicated their lives to foreign mission service. Again, Roy and Murty made ready to start for China. All of the belongings unpacked for their brief stay at South Lancaster were tucked again into trunks, handbags, and boxes. More than once in the weeks that Roy taught while they were searching for a Bible teacher, he deplored the fact that his reference books had been packed and was somewhere en route to the Far East. If only I had that book of mine, he would cry, while outlining the lessons or preparing a sermon or Bible study. Murty likewise missed the little handy things she had depended on for her homemaking or music. But most of their belongings had been sold or were in the freight shipment for the long voyage to Shanghai. Many people were ready to advise about this and about that. Roy listened to everyone and formed his conclusions accordingly. With the coming of the Christmas holidays, Elder Longacre arrived on the campus to head the Bible department. Teachers, students, and villagers all participated in a grand farewell reception for the Cottrells and presented them with an ear mattress, suitcases, and many other useful gifts. Packed away among the treasures to remind Roy of his happy days at South Lancaster is a small brown copy of the student idea, a 16-page booklet which was issued monthly by the students. On the front page of this now well-worn leaflet appears an article by the editor, Mary I. Coban, entitled, Greatness Versus Greatness, which pays honor to their beloved Bible teacher. In the article, the author leads the reader down a hall of fame, confronted on one side with portraits of Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Bismarck, and Lord Roberts. On the opposite wall hang the likenesses of St. Paul, Calvin, Luther, and Livingston. Coming to the last portrait, she stated, Here we look long and fondly, and many tender memories sweep over us, for we are looking into the clear blue eyes of one we know and love. Every feature betrays purity of life and nobleness of purpose. The gold leaf on the frame is still fresh, and the paint on the canvas is scarcely dry. For has he not just left us, just given his life for China's millions? Concluding her editorial, the writer compares the earthly conquest of the historically famous generals to that great and final victory for the warriors of God. Still pondering upon what we have seen, we pass silently out. We now understandingly read greatness versus greatness. To each come with renewed strength the words, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. It was a well-deserved tribute. On January 3rd, 1908, 
In the midst of a swirling New England snowstorm, the members of the little community gathered at the railway station to bid the missionaries farewell. The last to say goodbye was Elder Farnsworth, as he grasped Roy's outstretched hands in a never-to-be-forgotten grip, he said. Remember, God never sends forth his ambassadors at their own charges. Then the bell rang. The conductor shouted his, All aboard! And they were off to the Far East on their great adventure for Christ. The end of chapter 9 of Pioneers Together. The biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Mertie, written by Josephine Cunnington Edwards.